welcome everybody to Crochet 101 on this Monday afternoon. My name's Claire. I'll be hanging out in the chat with you, answering questions there or forwarding them on to Michaels. Darren is actually your teacher there on screen. He was the one showing off his fingerless mitts earlier. Um, he'll be guiding us through the basics of crochet. So at the end of the class, you'll have all of the skills needed to make that item. We won't be making it in class. So if you just want to have a practice swatch or sit back and watch, then you can come back to the recording and make them later. Um, I'll also put the link to the handout in the chat in case you need that again. And now that all of that is out of the way, we'll let Darren take over. All right, welcome to class today. Uh, today we are going to learn, um, it's Crochet 101. So if you've never crocheted before, you've never even held yarn in your hand or used a crochet hook before, then you're in the right place because we're gonna start right from the very, very beginning. But if you do have crochet experience and you just want a good review, then this is a great place to come for a review. Um, it's always nice to get some extra practice or a good review in, but, but this is the place to be um, for beginners. So if you're a very, very beginner, you know, you're in the right place, do not be nervous. So we will take good care of you here. Um, so let's go ahead and switch. Oh, well, let me just, we're gonna be making these, the pattern we're going to review today at the end of class, we're going to learn all the skills we need to learn first, we have to learn, we're going to learn the skills we need to make these little wrist warmers, these little hand warmers. Um, this is what the pattern is for, but I am I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to adjust the pattern to make them a little bit longer so they cover like more of your hand and more of your wrist so i like to try to empower my students to uh change up patterns and make things that are bit this is much more suitable for my needs because i like it i like to cover my wrist because when i put on my coat i don't like my wrist to get cold so when i think it should cover a little bit of the hand so you, know, you can make it however you want that's the best part about um crocheting or knitting is you know you can do whatever you want so all right, let's go ahead and change the view to the view of my hands and we will get started with our class. Okay, so for today in class, I'm gonna be demonstrating with um, hometown, um, I'm gonna be using actually hometown bonus bundle. This is just a small ball of the regular hometown, but I just wanted you to see what um, the label looks like. So this is hometown. Um, I'm going to be using this color, which is Dallas gray. And the reason I'm using this for class is because this is a good yarn for demonstrating because it's a nice thick yarn and it shows up good on camera. But if you bought yarn to make the projects, then the yarn that the project is made out of is this Heartland yarn, which is a thinner yarn. So this is the yarn you need for the um, hand warmers. So that's the only reason I'm using two different yarns in class is because this one, this thicker one shows up on camera, which is a great um, yarn for teaching. So a little bit about yarn before we get started. So you wanna double check um, what size yarn you're buying. So yarn comes in a size, size one up to size seven. And size one is very thin like thread. And then a size seven is much, much thicker, like almost like a, a row. Um, this one is a size four and this one is a size six. So you can kind of see um, the difference. You know, the size six is quite a bit thicker. Um, it gives you the number on the side. So this right here is telling us it is a size four. And it gives a recommendation right here of what size crochet hook you should use. And this is recommending a J10, which is also a six millimeter. So there's a couple different ways you're gonna hear hooks being spoken about, about the size. So J10, and sometimes, you know, that can be, people can kind of interpret when they're making hooks, maybe it's slightly bigger or slightly smaller. Um, a six millimeter, however, though, is um, an exact unit of measurement. So it's like a scientific unit of measurement. So you do want to try to go by the millimeters if possible. Um, I'm not real comfortable with millimeters either. I usually go with the J, but of course millimeters are scientifically more accurate. So just make sure um, you're looking at the right thing and you understand how the hooks are numbered. 
for their sizes. So this yarn, which is much thicker, this is a size six, which is a super bulky. And this one is recommending an N13 or a nine millimeter hook. So you just wanna double check. If you don't have the right hook size, usually you can go up or down one hook size and it's not gonna be a crisis, especially for simple projects when you're first learning. Um, it does become more important later on. Um, and depending on how you crochet, if you're crochet very loose or very tight, it can make a big difference. But for your first day, when you're first practicing, you know, you don't need to worry about stuff like that so much. Um, these yarns are both available on uh, lionbrand.com or on michaels.com. So they come in a lot of really great varieties of color. And, you know, they're, they're both great for uh, different types of projects and really good for working with. So I'm going to be using this hook, this wooden hook today by Lion Brand. Um, and for the larger yarn that I'm going to be demonstrating with, I'm going to use the N13, which it recommends, which is also a nine millimeter. So there's, again, the two different ways you can talk about the size of it. And just a little bit about a crochet hook. Um, it's really basic, but just so that you understand that they are sometimes shaped different. This little point right here, this is the head of the crochet hook. And sometimes they're very sharp and sometimes they're very rounded so they can be shaped different. This is the mouth. So this, um, the deep part in there and then the hook, that is the mouth of the crochet hook. And then this part that slants down is, I've heard it called the neck or the throat. So sometimes on different hooks, um, you'll find this is shaped more, it's more of a slant or maybe it's, it's less slanted. Um, sometimes this mouth is very deep and sometimes it's very shallow. Um, and then in, within different combinations of all of those, sometimes the head can also be shaped different. So if you get a crochet hook and you can't use it or you don't like it, um, don't think that you're just like not using it right. Sometimes people just don't like different types of hooks. Some of them are shaped different. Some of them have a different properties and you're just not gonna like them. So. If you have a hook that you don't like, you know, try a couple of different brands, try a couple of different shapes. They come in wood, plastic, metal. I like the wooden ones. I do like the metal ones quite a bit. Um, so you can see these two hooks here are actually shaped quite a bit different. Um, so sometimes you'll like one better than the other one. I always like to point that out to students. Um, this right here is the shaft. And this part here is what is actually nine millimeters. And then there's a finger rest right here for you to hold it. So that's just the basic parts of the hook. So just kind of knowing that they're sometimes shaped different, that can sometimes help, you know, you understand why you like one type of a hook and maybe a different brand you just really can't use. So any questions about yarn selection, um, yarn sizes, um, hook selection or hook sizes, any questions about that at all? Just some real basic information to kind of get us started. For practicing, it's okay for students to just use um, whichever hook might be suggested on their yarn label, right? Yeah, for practicing or even, even for a project, you know, use whatever, it's best to start with the hook that is suggested or recommended. And then, you know, if you don't have that hook, you can go up or down one size, usually without too much a problem. So you kind of want to make sure it's working before you, you know, get too far into your project, but usually the one recommended or up or down one size is okay. And that was just specifically for like people following along in class today. Okay. Oh yeah. For today. Yeah, it's fine. For practicing, you can, as long as the hook, like you wouldn't want to use this great big hook with this thin yarn because it's going to, it's going to look weird. You're not going to feel like you're doing it right. So you, you do want to try to use a hook that's close to what it's recommended. That's, that's what I would say. Does that answer that? Is that what the question was? I think that clears it up for everybody. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to attach the yarn to this hook. And the way we do that is we create a slip knot and then we can put that slip knot on our hook to get it attached. And you might already know how to tie a slip knot. So if you're a knitter or if you were in like the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, you might already 
if you do macrame, you might already know how to um, tie a slip knot. There are many, many ways, but I'm going to demonstrate another. I'm going to demonstrate one way here today, and you certainly don't have to use this way, but you know this is one good way. I um, call this way short over long. So you take your short piece of yarn, which is going to end up being your yarn tail, and you make a loop. You make a circle. And you put that over your long piece of yarn. And then the long piece of yarn is what's connected to your working yarn. So it's very long. It's, you know, it could be 200 yards long or whatever. So we start like this, short over long, make this little circle. You put your hand inside the circle. You slip your hand underneath the strand of yarn. You grab hold of the tail and you're gonna loop that back through. You hold on to the tail and the working yarn together, just so that the tail doesn't pull back through. And then all you do is you just loop it back through and that creates a slip knot. So now for crochet, it is, it's much better and it's more, it's ideal if the tail is what controls the size of the slip knot. And that's gonna become more important later on in other projects. But if you get in the habit of doing that now, then that'll just be the way you do it. So it's nice if the tail is what controls the size of the slip knot. And you know you did it correct if it just pulls out like that and you end up with nothing. So that's, that's how you know it's correct. I'm gonna demonstrate this a few times. You make a circle, you make a circular shape. You put the short tail over the long, so short over long. And then you reach under, you grab a hold of your tail and the working yarn, and then you loop it back through. You just loop it back through and you cinch it up. So you make a circle. Make a bigger circle so you can see. So you put your hand in the circle, you go under the circle, and you're gonna grab the tail. Take the tail and hold it with the working yarn. And then you're just gonna loop that back through. Okay, does that make sense? Wanna see it again or do we feel good about it? Questions? How do we feel about that? Uh, we do have a couple of requests to see it again. So that's pretty much Okay, so make a circle, put the short piece over the long piece, so short over long, put your hand in the center of the circle, slip under the edge of the circle, so you're sneaking under, you're gonna grab hold of that tail with your finger, but you're gonna hold on to the tail and to your working yarn, and then all you're doing is you're kind of looping, you're just kind of looping it around your finger and you pull it back through. And that's kind of how it looks like in real life. In real life, I just do it like that. It's the same thing, but you're just holding it, twisting it, grabbing the tail and pulling it through. It's really the same thing as this much easier than it looks. Sometimes when you're breaking something down step by step, it starts to look really complex. Um, but it's, it's really, try not to make it into a, a complex situation. It's actually pretty, pretty easy. Okay. So once you get your slip knot tied, I mean, was that good or is there a specific spot where we're getting hung up or is there a certain thing that we're not understanding or? Um, we have one quick question. Can you just tie a knot? You know, you can, you can, basically you can do, you know, anything you want to. Um, if you start out today with just tying a knot, it's probably gonna get you through. But for 
more complicated projects and for projects later on, you are going to want to um, do this slip knot. Um, if you can't seem to get the slip knot, don't let that stop you. Don't let that be a blocking point. You know, just tie a regular knot and push forward. But you know, you are going to want to learn that going forward. So, you know, best practice. I always try to teach best practices. Best practice is to tie a slip knot where the tail is what's controlling it. But if you just, you know, tie a regular knot, I'm sure that you can probably make that work as well. Okay. Once I'm a very flexible teacher, some teachers would absolutely tell you, no, you cannot do that. That and but you know, I feel like you need to do what you need to do. So, and then you just pop that on your crochet hook. You cinch it up. You do want to make sure everything is um, you don't want it to be tight. So we're not trying to, to tie it securely onto the hook. Everything should move tight. I'm, I'm sorry, everything should move loosely. We don't want it tight. Your tail should be about six or eight inches long. This is a little bit too long. You don't want it too short though. If it's very short, then um, it's gonna be hard later on. We're gonna sew this tail in um, later on as part of our finishing. And if it's very short, then it's gonna be hard to sew in. If it's very long, you end up wasting a little bit of yarn and sometimes it gets in the way. So, you know, about six or eight inches is about the correct length, so. Okay, so any questions about that? The next step is to uh, work at the crochet chain. We're ready to move on to that. Yep, let's go ahead with the chain. Okay. So when you work a crochet chain, that's gonna do two things for us. It establishes how many stitches we're going to be using and it establishes how wide our piece is going to be. So I'm going to crochet 11 chains and then I'm gonna be working with only 10 stitches. So that's something we're gonna cover in a few minutes. So for a crochet chain, you wanna wrap your yarn around your hook. And you can see I'm, I'm right-handed, so I'm holding, I'm working the hook with my right hand. I'm guiding the yarn in my left hand. And in my pointer finger and my thumb, I'm holding the yarn, I'm holding onto that slip knot right under my hook. And I'm kind of pulling down, which it kind of opens up there. See, so when I pull down, it opens up that little window, that little triangular window under my hook. And it gives, uh, it creates a little bit of space for me to pull that hook through. So this is how I hold mine. I kind of pull it right there. It opens up that space and then it makes it much easier. So you wrap, you can either grab it with the hook or you can wrap it around. So whichever way you want to do. And then you turn the hook so that it faces down and then you pull it back through that slip knot and that counts as one. And then you pick up, you yarn over, so you're picking up another strand of yarn. As you pull it back towards that loop, you turn the hook so that the mouth is facing down and then you pull it through and that's two. And you can see I'm not cinching that up really tight you wanna leave a little extra space. So when you're making a chain, the chain tends to get very, very tight. That's one problem people face when they crochet is they make their chain very, very tight. So you wanna, especially when you're first learning, you wanna get in the habit of trying to keep it a little bit loose. So yarn over. And if I try to pull it straight back through, you can see it won't go because then the, the loop gets caught up in the mouth of the hook. So that's why you, as you're pulling it back towards that loop, you have to turn it down. And then I usually turn it straight back up. You don't wanna leave a great big loop like that. You don't wanna pull it super tight like that, but you do wanna have a little bit of space and you'll, you'll get in the habit as you practice of how much space you need. So um, you just want it to be easy for it to go through. 
So if I'm trying to pull it through and it won't go through, I know I've pulled it too tight. And if I'm doing this and it's going through way up here, then I know I've, I've pulled it too loose. So you'll, you'll kind of get the hang of that as you're practicing. Okay, so let me do a couple more and then I'll start over from the very beginning. So yarn over, bring it through. And then once you get in the hang of it, once you get, it looks kind of like this. And then I'm gonna readjust my grip after I do a couple of chains. See, it's starting to get hard to pull it through. So I'm gonna readjust my grip. And that's the chain. So I'm gonna take everything out. We'll start from the beginning and then I'll wait and see if you have any questions about any particular aspect of that. We do have My a question about how you're holding the working yarn in your left hand or how you're tensioning it. Okay. So I've got my slip knot. The tail is controlling the slip knot. So there are many, many ways of holding the yarn and tensioning the yarn through your hand. I do it this way, and this is the easiest way that I've learned to do it. This is how my mother does hold her yarn, and I learned from watching her. This is what my mother taught me how to do. So you just hold it. I just hold it between my middle finger and my ring finger, and I kind of press them together so it, it's not just loose. It's kind of tight there. And when I'm crocheting, I kind of like bend it so it's kind of like that. And that way I keep it tight, but yet it, it flows through my fingers smoothly. So I don't have to stop and readjust my tension. So that's how I've always held my yarn that. I've always done it this way. So um, I know some people do other things where they might do it like this. And you can see, you know, that way it is also still sliding through my fingers. I don't have to readjust my grip, my tensioning. Um, I've seen all kinds of fancy things where people wrap it all the way, or, you know, I, I don't know. There's all kinds of, if you talk to 50 crocheters, you'll probably have 25 different ways of holding your yarn. But uh, whatever is going to feel the most natural in your hand is what I'm going to say is the right way. So you might want to try some different ways. But when I pick up my yarn, that's just how it naturally fits in my hand. And that's just the way I've always, always done it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven. Okay. So I'm going to stop here for just a second and see if we have any questions. Question on counting the chains. Um, do you count the slip knot as one of the chains? Not, not really. So let's look at it. That was going to be the next thing I wanted to talk about anyway. So the slip knot, see the slip knot's right have to here. Zoom in, Darren. We can barely see that. Sorry. I was trying to make my phone zoom in. It won't seem to zoom in. So the slip knot kind of becomes this knot at the end. So it doesn't really become part of the one of the stitches. But when you want to look at your chain, so you can see it almost kind of looks like a braid um, or like these V shapes. And <clears throat> like it almost looks like the links of a chain, you know. So you count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you count each one of those, 10, 11, and that's how you count them. So are you guys able to see what I'm doing? So one, two, 
One, two, three. So that's how you count them. Each one of these kind of V shapes is going to be a, basically a stitch. So right there, that's what we're looking at right there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Does that make sense? So I crocheted, I made 10, I'm sorry, I made 11 chains, but I'm gonna be working with 10 crochet stitches. Um, when we're counting, also when we count our chains, we don't count this loop that's on our hook. So the active loop on our hook does not count as one of our chains. So, and when, usually when you count, it's gonna have you count it from your hook. So and um, it's gonna say, you know, skipping the first chain from your hook, so meaning skipping that one or skipping three chains from your hook. So one, two, three, it could be that um, one, two, three, it could be any number of chains. So you, frequently you'll be counting it from your hook. So the loop on your hook does not count that's your active loop. And so then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, so that's how you count them. So I have 11 chains. Um, I'm gonna skip the first one for single crochet. And what happens is that first stitch is not going to be, be that first chain is not gonna become a stitch, but it's gonna be turned up on its side like that. And it's gonna become the side edge. So we have to have, and this will make more sense as you're practicing and I'll continue to explain it. But one stitch has to come up to make the side, and then we go all the way across. If we didn't do that, then what would happen would be this stitch would end up being kind of pushed in and slanted, and you wouldn't get a nice edge. And as we practice, that'll start to make more sense. So you skip, when you make your chain, I have 11 chains, I'm gonna end up with 10 stitches. So you skip the first chain, and then, you enter, sorry, it gets dark so early here and I have my desk light on, but it's throwing a shadow, I think. So you wanna find that first chain and you can kind of feel for it. There should be a hole where we're just gonna go under one strand of yarn. So we're gonna go under right there. So just go through one strand of yarn Yarn over, bring up a loop. I have two loops on my hook. Yarn over, bring it through both. And I'm finished my single crochet. That's one single crochet finished. And then you wanna to go to the next chain and you can feel it, you know, feel, feel for that or look for it. You go through, and I'm just having one strand of yarn on my hook. I'm just going through with one strand of yarn. Yarn over. Pull it through your chain. Two loops on my hook. Yarn over and pull it through both. And then that is my single crochet finished. And then the next chain. right there. How does that look? Are you guys able to see where I'm going in the chain? Is it clear? So that's what the chains look like. That's the chain. And the next stitch is going to go right in there. So right in there. And then once you get going, once you get the hang of it, it actually moves pretty fast.
Okay, so what I'm just going to finish this real quickly and then see what questions we have. Okay, so I finished all of my stitches. So that's the first row complete. I have my chain and my first row complete. Now then what I have to do to turn and do my second row is I have to chain one. And that chain one becomes the side for my next row. So that becomes the height. So that becomes the side. And then you turn your work. And it's a good idea to stop here and count your stitches. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's very easy when you're learning how to crochet to either add a stitch or lose a stitch by mistake. And so you want to be careful about that. So after each row, that's why I say, like, let's work with 10 or 15 stitches, but no more than that, because you want to be able to count them and keep track of them. And counting a stitch, you want to look at the top of your work, and it's right here. So one, two, three, four, five. So you just count. Look for these, again, these kind of V shapes right here. And each one of those counts as a stitch. Okay, any questions about that? Let's see here. We had a bunch of questions come in at once, so I'm sorting through them all. Um, we have a couple people who want to see uh, the last stitch on the first row. Before we get too far ahead, you can rip that out a little bit. So go back. Okay, so. There's the last stitch right here. So you just do the last stitch. Okay, I've completed my stitch. Now I have to do chain one for my single crochet to create the side. And then you turn your work. And I'm gonna show you how to do the second row. And I'm gonna show you a little, a few tricks to kind of make things easier. So you find that stitch, that's my first stitch, that first kind of V shape right here. And we, we're gonna go one, each one of these V shapes counts as a stitch and we're gonna put one stitch in each one. So we're gonna maintain our 10. Um, we've got our, our chain one, which creates the side. And so we're gonna skip that chain one, that chain one is just for the side. And then we're going to go right in the first stitch. And we want to make sure that we're going under both um, loops of that V. So we're going to go under both loops of that V. Yarn over, bring up a loop. Yarn over, pull it through both. And at this point, as we're learning, it's nice to put a stitch marker on that first stitch. So we've got a stitch marker on our first stitch and that'll help us keep track of where our first stitch is. So the second stitch, you can see is right here, under both strands of yarn, yarn over, we've got two loops on my hook, yarn over, bring it through two. Enter the second stitch, yarn over, Yarn over, bring it through two. And you can either look on the side here. If you look on the side, you can kind of see these holes. So you can look for those as your stitch, or you can look across the top and look for these V shapes to find your stitch. Okay. And enter the stitch, bring up a loop, 
yarn over, bring it through two. And this is single crochet. Quickly finish this row and we'll start the next row and then we'll stop for any questions. Once you kind of get the groove of it, it kind of looks like this. You can actually get going. People do crochet very, very fast. Okay, so this is my last stitch. And when you do your last stitch, we're gonna wanna put a stitch marker in that last stitch to help us keep track of where our last stitch was. So sometimes that's gonna be important. It's important to keep track of your stitches. So I'm gonna chain one to create my height. That's for my next, the height for my next row. Turn my work. And I'm going to put one chain I've got my stitch marker there, so I'm going to take it out, put my finger there. I'm going to do one stitch in that first stitch. I'm going to put a stitch marker in my first stitch to keep track of that. And you won't have to do this with the stitch markers after you practice, but as you're learning, it really helps you to learn how to keep track of where your stitches are if you're putting that stitch marker there and so you're sure. So I'm 100% sure that's where my stitch is. Okay, look for my next Darren, one. I think we gotta stop and go back here. We've got a lot okay. of confusion. <laughs> all righty. I think we need to go all go the way back to where we have 11 chains. Okay. So what were the specific questions? Any specific questions or just general confusion? Which I'm in support of general confusion. I don't know. Um, when you're making the chain and then on your, your second row, people have noticed that in the chain, you're only going through one piece of yarn or under one piece of yarn. And then the next row, you're going under two pieces of yarn. Correct. Yes, yes. that's correct. And, um, we did have someone in the chat mention the back bump of the chain. We're not going to cover that in this class. It's easier mm -hmm. if everybody just goes through um, one loop on the chain there. Yes. So then once we've got our 11 chains, then we move down to only 10 stitches because you're going to lose that first chain is going to be your turning chain and that was creating the height of the for the next row so that your working yarn goes up to the right level i am going to say something very quickly and then i'm going to let it go i'm not going to dwell on it when you're entering the chain you can this is what i was doing i was picking up just one strand right here which i think is the easiest way or you can pick up two strands right here, or you can go on the back and pick up this back bump. But it, it gets very confusing if you don't know, if you're just learning. Um, so just because somebody brought it up, I did wanna mention that there are at least three ways of entering the chain, but um, for beginners and for people that are just learning, I strongly recommend let's learn one way. And then as you're practicing future projects, you can practice you know, the other ways, because they can be very, if you keep doing it different ways, you're gonna get confused. So, so I have 11 chains. I'm gonna skip the first one. Remember the active loop on my hook does not count. So I'm skipping the first one. And I'm gonna enter my chain by going under just one strand of yarn. Yarn over, bring up a loop, yarn over bring it through two. So does that, does that answer that question about skipping the first one and where I'm going in on the chain? Do we need to review that again? How do we feel? So I am just picking up one strand for the chain. I think if we just go slowly across the chain here, hopefully that will help. So you can feel for that one strand or you can look for it and look for this V shape. And then you're gonna hit the middle of that V and just, you'll, you'll find it. It's, and don't, 
don't fuss over it too much or fret about it too much. Just, you know, go through the chain. You know, just sometimes if you just push through, you're going to get it. Um, push through, do your best, and then stop and look at it. And if it's not right, then, you know, we'll, you can keep practicing. But if you really like dwell on it and fuss over it too much, then it, sometimes it just makes it into an impossible condition to work through. Um, it's probably easier than you think. So just find that, just find a hole there, just find the spot to go through. So you can kind of feel with your finger and see if you can't quite look for it. So that's the end of the first row. So I've got my chain and my first row of single crochet. And now for single crochet, you chain one and that creates the side, that side edge. Before we move on to the next row, could you sort of show where to put the stitch markers so you aren't going to lose your first or your last stitch? Okay. I'm going to put my stitch marker on my first stitch right here. And not the chain that we did. So do we want to count them and see? Sometimes it's good to count and make sure we didn't do it wrong. Maybe we did it wrong. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I did it right. Yay. So sometimes I do it wrong too. So anyone can make a mistake. Anyone can do it wrong. So I've got my first stitch. I've got my last stitch. And this last stitch we're going to change pretty quick because that's going to become, you know, once we turn our work. But we've got our 10 stitches. I did my chain one. Now I'm going to turn my work. And I'm going to put, I'm going to put a chain, one, one, I'm sorry, I'm going to put one single crochet in each one of these stitches. So I'm going to take this one out. But I'm going to kind of keep my finger there to keep track of it. And at this point, we're going through both. And there are later on, there are other stitches where sometimes we do different things, but let's we're learning this stitch today. So today we're going to go through both. And then I'm going to put a stitch marker on that first stitch to keep track of it. And then that way it'll help me keep track. And then I'm going to find each stitch going across. So, and you can look for the kind of the hole on the side, or you can look at the top to find your stitch. Or you can kind of look for both. You can kind of feel for that hole and then turn it to find, make sure you're going in the right place. That's kind of how I do it. I kind of hold it like this. So you're gonna go through. And you can see I'm picking up two strands of yarn here under both. Yarn over, pull it through. Yarn over, pull it through both. Enter the stitch. Bring up a loop. I have two loops on my hook. So it seems like everyone understands how to do the single crochet, but the questions are just about like where keeping track of the stitches and is that is that what most, most of the questions are? Uh, we did have some on the single crochet itself. I think hopefully. Um, doing this slowly and then yes, some questions on um, going under the two. Basically, if you're going under the two pieces of yarn you're looking at at the top, you are also going through the hole that you can see on the side. It's the same thing. You're just looking the at it two thing. different ways. 
Yes, I hope that wasn't confusing. Yeah, that's two different ways of looking at the same thing. So if you find that hole on the side, that's why I said find the hole on the side and then turn it and find that V at the top to make sure you're looking in the right place. So if I'm finding that hole here on the side, right there, and then I turn it, I'm looking at the V. So it's the same thing. But sometimes it's, if you can't see it one way, if your yarn's very fuzzy or if your stitches are very tight, you know, sometimes it's hard to see it. So that's two different ways of kind of verifying where you are. So you enter, yarn over, bring up a loop, yarn over, and then pull it through both. And you can just kind of watch as you're entering the stitch. So enter the stitch and you can see I've gone under both. And if you only go under one, you're gonna see, okay, so there's only one strand of yarn on my hook, that's not right. So you go under both, yarn over, bring it through, yarn over. So now here's, um, so sometimes if your work is kind of stretched out of shape or if it's very loose or sometimes if it's very tight, it can be distorted. And sometimes it might be hard to tell, like where is my last stitch? So if I didn't have this stitch marker, so I know that's my last stitch, but if I didn't have it, um, sometimes that can look, maybe if it's turned under, sometimes it can look like, oh, I finished all my stitches. You know, that that's the edge right there. I finished my stitches. So I'm going to chain up turn my work, um, maybe you don't realize. So it, clearly I have another stitch, but maybe you're not gonna realize. And then this is why I say it's important to count your stitches. So let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I have nine stitches. So I know I did something wrong. And then if you start looking, I mean, clearly in this situation, you can see that that is definitely a missed stitch, but sometimes, you know, it might look more like that. Like if these stitches are looser and that one's tighter, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell. So that's why having this, and then if you kind of reshape it out, you can say, okay, that's where my missed stitch was. So I'm gonna take out and then clearly I can see that's my stitch. So I'm gonna go under that. So that's where the stitch markers can really help us as we're learning. So now I've got my stitches. I'm going to put the stitch marker there. Because sometimes, again, when you turn your work, do my chain one, turn my work. So where am I supposed to put my next stitch? Let's take this out. Sometimes it's confusing. Okay, so that looks like a stitch right there. That could be a stitch. Or is that the stitch? So here's my loop. That's my active loop right here. That's my active loop. This is the first kind of stitch or chain from the hook. So that's my chain one. So that's where I did the chain one. So that's not a stitch. So this is my first stitch. So if you kind of look at your work, you have to learn how to kind of read it. Remember what you just did, and then you can kind of sort it out. But as we're learning, that doesn't always come as easy as it will later on after you've practiced. So if you keep that stitch marker there, when I look at it, if I look at that, I'm like, that's that's my first stitch, so that must be my chain. And it's gonna help you learn and keep track of where things are kind of falling in place. So enter both, bring up a loop. So I have two loops on my hook, yarn over, pull it through both, Readjust your stitch. And if you hate these stitch markers and you don't want to do it, you don't have to use them. But I, you know, it, it does kind of help you keep track as you're learning. Okay. What questions do we have? Is that thoroughly confusing or? Um, you have a question. I answered it in chat, but I think it's a good general question. Does it matter uh, if you're, which direction you're wrapping the yarn around the hook? If I always wrap it this way, because then when you turn it down and pull it through, it flows easy. If you wrap it this way, then it, it doesn't, I feel like it technically probably wouldn't necessarily matter as much, but what do you think, Claire? How do you do it? 
Is it? I know in knitting it's crucial, but in crochet, I feel like it's. But if you do it this way, you end up with it. It seems to be the same. I think technically the correct answer is always to wrap from like you did sort of from the back of the hook to the front of the hook. And if you do it the other way, maybe not in a single crochet, but in different types of stitches, I think it's going to get harder to work through those taller stitches. It just lends itself too to this. Like you just go under it like that and put straight through. Whereas if you're trying to then do that, you can see how that's just harder. So I'm gonna say, wrap it this way, kind of clockwise. Is that clockwise, that makes sense? Or across the front maybe? I've just never seen anyone wrap it the other way. So I don't know. Things usually matter though, right? Don't they usually matter? They do, yes. There's we are reason somewhere back in history that we all do it this way now. Yeah, but when you start doing fancier stitches, if you start doing like crochet two together, like you said, triple crochets or doubles, half doubles, it, it'll, it's, you know, and start to make things look different so and we've had a couple people ask um when you are turning your work like when you finished your row and you're ready to start the next one um does it matter which direction you flip the work then i was always told so i finished my row i did my chain one that you turn it the way you turn the pages of a book so that's how i do it like i and then just turn it. But I, this one I'm gonna say probably doesn't matter a whole lot because once you turn it, however you're turning it, as long as you're at this point where you're, you know, you're starting at this corner and you're, as long as you're not turning it so that you're, see if you turn it and then end up like, see how that's kind of twisted around. Like as long as anything's not twisted or I think it's fine. So we're, you know, we're getting kind of close to the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly do a single crochet across this one. I want to show you how to end your work. Quickly touch on weaving in ends, and then we're going to look at the pattern, which is very simple. So I'm going to quickly go across this row, just so I have a little bit more fabric to work on. And once you get the hang of it, you can go even much faster than this. I don't tend to crochet fast, but some people can really go very, very fast. I enjoy the process. I like, I use it to relax, so I don't like to crochet super fast. All right, so I finished my last stitch. I'm finished my row, I finished my piece. So for some reason, I'm just making this little tiny piece. That's all I need. So when you're finished, however big, you could keep this going and make a scarf. You know, you could do all kinds of things, but I'm just gonna cut it. And so you do want to make sure you're cutting it and leaving a long enough um, tail to weave in your ends. And this one is about, it's about seven inches. So, you know, you want to leave at least four or five. And then all you do is you pull this straight up and you can see as I'm pulling the loop up, the tail is getting smaller and it pulls through, pulls through that final loop and everything is secure. Nothing is going to unravel. So what you want to do is you want to find, um, these are large eyed blunt needles. So they have a large enough eye to put yarn through uh, and they're blunt, they're not sharp. So, you know, you're not piercing the strands of the yarn, you're going in between them. So you just you go ahead and thread that needle. Try not to split your yarn. Now crochet stitches are three dimensional. Um, they're very thick. So you wanna try to hide your ends um, in the middle of the stitches. So my yarn came through this loop. So I don't wanna go back through the same one. So I'm just going to kind of go down 
I'm just kind of securing it. So I'm just going down through kind of that stitch kind of right below it. And you can see that I'm going in the middle of that stitch. So you can't see my needle any on other of the sides. So I'm going in the middle of that stitch. So you pull it down and there's, there's not a, there's many right ways to do this. What you want to accomplish is you want to secure your ends and you want to hide them so that they're not distorting the shape of your work. And so I'm going to go across. So again, I'm going to find these um, kind of stitches here, these strands of yarn. And I'm making sure, see my needle's not showing on either side, so I know I'm going through the middle. But if I, let's say I did it like that, and if you turn your work over and you can see your needle, then that means when you pull your yarn through, you're gonna have a strand of yarn going that way and it's not gonna be hidden. So you wanna go through the center of these stitches so you're not seeing your needle. And when you do this, it'll be easier than it looks. And so I'm just gonna follow it across. So you can see here, I'm just kind of going under their strands of yarn. It's not showing on that side. And you just wanna make sure you're not changing the way your work looks. So you can see here, it's, it's pretty invisible. So you don't wanna pull it really tight because now look what happened. If you do, you can kind of massage it out. See how I'm just kind of going up let me do kind of a zigzag and then going that way. But you wanna make sure, and the thing as you're doing this, you wanna stop and look and make sure you can't see where you were, you're not pulling it tight and you're not doing anything weird to your fabric. And then check this side, check both sides. And then you want to kind of go up to the next row above and then go back in the opposite direction. So you're going back the original way that you came. See, I'm not I'm going in the middle of the stitches. And people make a lot of like, people have a lot of opinions about how to do this and they'll tell you all kinds of crazy things to do. I like to just keep things as simple as possible. Just make sure you're not changing the way your work looks. You're not distorting it. You're not adding any um, texture because you're going in the middle of the stitches. And then pull your, pull your tail, cut it off flush, and then massage it out. And that's going to disappear back in the middle of your work, and you're never going to see it again. So you don't want to tie knots, and you don't want to do anything drastic because now when you feel this, you're not feeling any lumps or bumps from knots. Um, knots do come untied and they cause your work to unravel. So this is the most secure way to finish your work, right? So if you wanna look at the pattern for the fingerless gloves, it's nice to be able to make a project. And right now we're pretty much at the end of class. So if anyone has to leave right on time, a reminder that you can watch this recording. It'll be on the Michael's YouTube channel in about 24 to 48 hours. You can come back and watch anything that you might've missed. This goes pretty fast. This is a pretty easy pattern. Um, uh, it tells what we need. We need Lion Brand Yarn Heartland. Uh, the original one was made with Yellowstone, but I used um, Dry to Torgus. And I also did one in Sequoia. So you can pick whatever color you like, great colors in this, this line of yarn. It's using a crochet hook in a size I9. Now, if you remember from the beginning, that yarn calls for a J, but this is asking you to use one size smaller. That's gonna make the fabric a little bit more tight and a little bit warmer, and that Aaron, makes it nice for gloves. Yes? A J is larger than an I. Oh, oh, sorry. The pattern oh. uses I. Sorry, I got those confused. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm like, did I say it backwards? Yes, yeah, so the, it's I, J, K. Yeah, I is smaller. <laughs> you could convince me I was wrong. I would totally believe you. So yeah, this um, I9 will make it just a little bit more snug for, for warmth for your hand. And then large eyed blunt needles for weaving in the ends. We're not gonna worry about gauge because that's not crucial for this project. So for the wristers, you're gonna chain 21. So after you've practiced a bit, you can you start the wristers, chain 21. 
You're gonna single crochet in the second chain from the hook and in each chain across. So just like I showed you going, you can go under just one loop for the chain. Um, we're chaining 21, but because we're skipping, you know, we're going in the second chain from the hook, we're skipping the first one from the hook. So that's gonna give us our 20 stitches. We talked about that. Um, you're gonna go all the way across, chain one, turn, and then you're gonna single crochet in each stitch across. And it's a good idea to count them and make sure you're maintaining 20. Repeat row two until your piece measures about six and a half inches from the beginning and then fasten off just like I showed you, cut your yarn and just pull it through. So this is very simple and we covered everything in class. You might need to practice a little before you start and that's normal. But after you've practiced a little bit, you'll be able to make these. And then this is, I'll show you how to seam it quickly. But this one, this is the, this is the hand warmers. Now I made them a little different. I used um, a different technique and I made them much bigger because I feel like this is more useful for me. And the only thing I changed was instead of chaining 21 for the larger wristers, I chained 31. Um, and I just wrote it here to keep a note. But then this other pair that I made, I chained 41. And so you can see they're even, they go further up the wrist. So you can do anything you want. And that's what I wanna to try to empower everyone to realize you don't have to follow the pattern. If you're making these for somebody that has a very large hand, you, instead of going six and a half inches, maybe go seven and a half. If you're making them for a child, instead of going six and a half inches, maybe go four inches or five and a half. You know, you can, you can measure the hand, wrap it around the hand and try it. So don't be afraid to make some adjustments. And then now you are a crochet designer. You are a crochet wear designer and you're ready to go, right? You can start writing patterns and selling them online. So that's, it's as easy as all that. I mean, that's all there is to it. So what happens though when you're following the pattern, you end up with a rectangular piece of cloth like this. And when you fasten off, um, I've kind of worked this up and taken it apart several times, but when you fasten off, you don't wanna cut your yarn short. You wanna leave a very long piece of yarn. Um, so you're gonna be using that as for weaving in your ends. So when you fasten off, you leave a yarn tail that's maybe about 15 inches or 10 inches or a little bit longer. And so what you'll end up with is, I'm just gonna reattach this quickly. You'll end up with a rectangle like this and just leave a long strand of yarn for weaving in your ends. And then you'll just fold it in half. And it's not a bad idea for a small project like this, it's not as crucial. But if you have a bigger project, it becomes much more important because fabric can become stretchy and you might get to the end when you're sewing it and you're like, well, they were the same length when I started. You know, why is one side longer than the other? Because you know, it's stretchy. So it's not a bad idea to use clips to hold it together while you're sewing. Okay, just pretend that was attached. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the top edge of our work and we're gonna see right here, these are um, our stitches. So if we were gonna continue to crochet, we would be working with these stitches. And if we look on this side was our chain, you now we can find the same thing over here that looks pretty much the same. So we're gonna find a nice corner. We're gonna get right there on that corner and right on this corner, and mine doesn't look so good because I've, again, I've taken this out and redone it several times. So yours will be fresh and nice. And then the next, you're gonna go in each one of these, just as if you were crocheting, you don't wanna skip any. So pick up two strands, pick up two strands on the next one, pull it through, and then go to the next stitch. So this is the next stitch. I'm gonna pick up two strands. You're not going all of a sudden gonna go really deep down here. You're not all of a sudden gonna skip. You're going to pick up your two strands and then pick up two strands over here. And this is the running stitch that I'm doing. And I like to hold my finger between the two strands or the two pieces of fabric so I can kind of keep everything sorted out and see exactly where I'm going. 
You can also do the whip stitch. So the whip stitch is you jump back over and you're always entering and exiting the fabric from the same side. So this is the whip stitch and you'd pick one and stick with one. But I like the running stitch and I'm always kind of zigzagging across. I exited the fabric here and I'm gonna enter back from the same side. And so it's the running stitch or basting stitch or the whip stitch. And so all you do is you, you go so far and then you put it on if you want to measure it against somebody's hand. You're gonna leave room for the thumb. So for leaving room for the thumb, what I do is then I just sew it on just one side because I'm leaving a hole for my thumb. So you can see I'm just kind of going back and forth on this just one side and figure out how big of a hole you need for either your thumb or whoever you're making it for. And then now we're gonna start attaching it to the other side. And you don't have to do this on your hand. I was just doing it on my hand so you can see what I'm doing. And then continue with whatever stitch you were doing for the seam. And if you do this and it doesn't look right, if you don't feel like you did a good job, you can take it out and give it another try. Um, knitted and crocheted fabric are very forgiving and you can take it out without ruining the fabric. Okay. And make sure you're getting yourself a nice corner at the top. And then to weave in your ends, I would just do it in the seam. I wouldn't do it in the body of the fabric for this part. See, I would just go down the seam again. And that gives me a chance to kind of close that little edge up where my thumb was. So you can kind of give yourself a little bit more security there and then kind of go back up the seam, maybe halfway back up and then cut it off and then turn it the right. That was the inside. So we're gonna turn it and then as you can see, I have a very cute little wrister and I'm ready to, you know, go for a walk, walk the dog, whatever you wanna do. So it's pretty much um, all that we have to cover today. If you have any questions going forward, you can feel free to contact me personally on either um, Facebook, just, you know, type in my name and my pictures there. You can send me a direct message on Facebook. Or uh, if you want to send me a message on Instagram, a direct message, my uh, screen name on there is Mr. Woolly Bear. Maybe Claire will put that in the chat. It's M-I-S-T-E-R Woolly Bear spelled out. So, and I usually try to answer the questions pretty quick. I can usually, I don't get many questions, so I can usually get back to people quick. But I hate the thought of like leaving you in a lurch. You know, if you have a question, it's nice to have somebody to turn to. So um, are there any final questions that we're ending? Anything? I want to thank quiet. everybody for sticking with us here. I know we went a little bit over, um, but remember that this was all recorded so you can watch it back again. And hopefully you have time to practice, 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 because that's really the key to getting comfortable with it. That's the key. The more you practice, the easier it will. And if the first time you make a pair, they don't turn out nice, the second pair, I promise, will be better. It'll, it'll get better each time you do it. So. All right, don't forget to practice. Let me know if you have any questions, send me a direct message, but thanks for coming to class. Have a great night.